Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University in the city of New York. Thank you for joining us for today's discussion on green recovery from COVID-19, perspectives from across the globe. The Center on Global Energy Policy is one of our most dynamic research centers at Columbia University and SEPA, and I'm very proud of the work that it's doing, including being a policy partner this week designing important conversations during Climate Week from a US and a global perspective. And I particularly want to acknowledge and thank Jason Bordoff, founding director of the center for his leadership of the center and for moderating today's discussion. As we consider the immense impact of COVID-19 globally and how it's changing our world from a health, economic growth, inequality perspective, it's also vitally important to consider how recovery measures around the world can be constructed to align with larger environmental and climate goals. There should be tremendous scope for nations to enact recovery and stimulus plans that are mindful of investments that support clean energy innovation and also produce jobs, of policy instruments that minimize distortions and have multiplier effects, of lessons learned from alternative carbon tax and other tax schemes. But will these be priorities, especially for economies under stress? Our discussion today will focus on green stimulus in several settings around the world, the US, the European Union, and in developing countries, including across Sub-Saharan Africa. And I also want to draw your attention to the work of the Center on Global Energy Policy that has uh, been tracking these developments through an energy policy tracker, following in real time how public financing is being used in the energy recovery packages. We're really excited to hear from scholars affiliated with us and policy leaders in the US and around the world. Dr. Maurizio Cardenas, visiting senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy and former Minister of Finance and Energy in Colombia. Eric Garcetti, mayor of Los Angeles, chair of the C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. And I'm also very proud to say an alumnus of Columbia SIPA. Wonderful to have you with us, uh, Mayor. And Damilola Ogumbiyi, CEO and special representative UN Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All, and Commissioner Kadri Simpson, EU Commissioner for Energy at the European Commission. Thank you all so much for joining us. We look forward to your perspectives. And it's a pleasure to turn this over to Jason Bordoff, Founding Director of the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia SIPA, to take us forward. Jason. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dean Janow. Thanks to all of you for joining us uh, on this uh, webinar, one of a virtual series of events we have all week long as policy partners for Climate Week NYC. Uh, again, my name is Jason Bordoff, uh, direct the Center on Global Energy Policy and a professor of practice at Columbia SIPA. And we're going to discuss today a topic that, as you heard, several of us at the Center on Global Energy Policy have been working on quite a bit, which is the possibility of a green recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. We know the collapse in economic activity resulting from the pandemic has been widespread and caused hardship. Experts predict it may be long and deep. This has led to calls for governments to help support families, create jobs, and stimulate economic activity through fiscal policy, particularly at a time when government borrowing is very cheap. And if we're going to invest in economic recovery, the question is whether and how we can also build back better. What are the opportunities for government spending to both boost the economy and to help catalyze progress on important social objectives, namely climate change? I will say so far the track record is pretty mixed. The EU, as we'll hear uh, in a moment, I assume from Commissioner Simpson, has developed a major stimulus plan that puts fighting climate change uh, at, at, at the center of Europe's recovery. But that example is not being followed in many other parts of the world. And Dean Jano just mentioned the tool we've developed, energypolicytracker.org. You can go to that and see how uh, stimulus money focused on energy is being spent. Uh, and I think it's probably fair to say not enough of it is yet targeted toward clean energy. At the same time, while the economic lockdowns have caused sharp drops in energy use and carbon emissions, both are rebounding pretty quickly. 
Oil demand at its peak fell nearly 25%. It'll probably end the year around 5% down. We see traffic levels uh, in major urban areas around the world back to, if not above, uh, their pre-COVID levels, uh, particularly in many cities as people uh, try to move to private vehicles rather than mass transit for the purpose of social distancing. So we're going to need policy, we're going to need government investment to change our trajectory toward a lower carbon one, as we must, because we are not yet on track for our deep decarbonization goals consistent with the Paris Agreement. We have a lot of work to do, and that's what we're going to talk about today with this extraordinary panel of experts and leaders in combating climate change. Let me first quickly say this event is being webcast live. The full video will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policies website in the coming days. For those joining via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. For those of you watching the live stream elsewhere, you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag CGEPLive and our Twitter handle at ColumbiaUEnergy. Uh, Dean Jane already announced our wonderful panelists, so I won't, uh, I won't introduce them again. I'm really delighted to have all four of them with us. I'm also pleased to introduce John Elkind, uh, my colleague at the Center on Global Energy Policy, a senior research scholar here and the former Assistant Secretary of Energy. I can't handle a panel this good myself, so he and I are going to tag team a bit in the moderation with our speakers in a moment. But first, we're going to start with a poll question to try to get a little bit of virtual engagement from all of you. We've put up a question here that you uh, will hopefully be able to go on your screen and vote on. And the question is, uh, this is data from the IMF and the Rhodium Group, what share of stimulus spending has gone toward green climate related priorities? And uh, the first question is in the US, the second question is in the EU, and the third question is in China. So take just a moment and vote on what percentage of spending has gone toward green climate related priorities. And then we will show you the answer in a moment. Looks like responses are still coming in, but let's show, let's show the answer. Let's show the right answers. 1% in the United States, 20%, uh, it should be 20% in the European Union, and 2% uh, and in China. Those are the correct answers. So you see quite a big difference in the European Union where 20% has gone toward green climate related spending. In the US, it is 1%, and in China, it is 2%. And again, that's data from the IMF and the Rhodium Group. So we're going to um, move now to the discussion. And uh, I'm going to ask each panelist to respond to an opening question, a broad question for about five or six minutes. And then we'll get into the moderated conversation. I'm going to turn first to Mayor Eric Garcetti, uh, who unfortunately has to depart a little bit early from the panel discussion. So I'm going to take advantage of his time with us to ask him to come in first and probably come back to him for a question or two after opening comments uh, first. It's a special treat to have Mayor Garcetti with us speaking for the first time at the Center on Global Energy Policy, certainly not the first time at Columbia, uh, not only because, as Dean Janow said, he's a graduate of Columbia SEPA, but it's also a personal privilege to welcome him here because he also happens to be one of my oldest friends. So uh, full disclosure of my personal bias, I am a big fan of Eric Garcetti's. And it's been wonderful to see the leadership he's shown in Los Angeles, especially on the urgent challenge of climate change. So let me turn to you first, Mr. Mayor, and ask if you could start by talking a little bit about what you're seeing in LA, about what is needed for economic recovery from the pandemic, what you are seeing in terms of the impacts of climate change and what is needed to combat it, and talk a little bit about where you think the responses to those crises might overlap in terms of public policy. Well, thank you, Jason, to you and Jonathan, and to Dean J. Now for inviting me. It's great to be with you from Los Angeles, Commissioner Simpson, Special Representative Ogunbi, and also uh, Minister Cardenas. It's a real honor to be on this panel with you as well. Um, you know, this is not new, um, but it is more complicated than it's ever been. I mean, I think uh, we in understand that right now we don't just have a crisis, we have intersecting crises. Obviously, the worst health pandemic of our lifetimes, the concomitant uh, economic um, suffering and dislocation um, here in the United States, but not unique to the United States, the calls for racial justice, and of course that crisis that predated all of this, uh, climate emergency. 
Um, in Los Angeles, I wear a few different hats. I'm the mayor of Los Angeles. It's the third largest metropolitan area now in the world. Tokyo's the largest. You and New York are second and we're a hair behind you. So 19 million people that have over a trillion dollar economy um, in an area that is the crossroads of kind of, uh, you know, North America, Latin America and the Pacific Rim. Um, but we have always seen our destiny tied very closely to our topography and our and our weather and um, to our climate. Um, whether it was the worst air that we had in America in the 60s and 70s when people were literally choking on smog, um, or more recently the fires that people see burning in our backyard. Uh, we have always kind of looked at not just having leadership inside our city, but the alliances we can form around the country and the world. So I also wear the hat of being the founding uh, chair of climate mayors, a bipartisan or tripartisan, I should say, because there's a lot of independent mayors, a group of mayors fighting and pledging to fight climate change in the United States of America and as chair of C40 cities, which is also misnamed because um, it's 96 cities actually, uh, but the 96 of the 100 largest cities in the world responsible for about a quarter of the world's GDP. So an immense economic uh, as well as environmental uh, force. And in each one of those incarnations, whether it's me as mayor, whether it's uh, as chair of climate mayors in the US or chair of C40 cities, um, we see kind of a nimbleness and an, an urgency at the uh, local level because we are the ones with firefighters who die on the front lines. We are the ones whose folks get, get flooded out. It is local communities where we live as human beings, increasingly urban communities, a majority of human beings. So you know, our sta the stakes have never been higher, not only to address the climate emergency, but to address simultaneously the intersection of those crises. So C40 kind of pulled the bat signal in the middle of the uh, pandemic. And one of the most moving experiences of my life was 55 of our 96 mayors got on a single call at the beginning of COVID-19 on what was this new platform called Zoom at the time. And we uh, started talking about what was happening. Um, in South Korea, we heard from uh, folks who were doing testing. We heard from the mayor of Delhi who locked down his city and then had a nation of a billion people follow him two days later. Um, the mayor of Milan, when that was the hot spot of the world and they were making decisions of who lived and who died in the hallways of hospitals. And there was a nimbleness that came from that, a good peer pressure that came from that. And there was a connectivity that we said, we're not gonna solve and rebuild our economy, solve on health if we don't also address climate. And so we put a task force report out that looked at there should be no stimulus anywhere that is not a green stimulus. Uh, we must reemphasize coming back to mass uh, public transportation, um, that we need to transform our economies to green energy economies uh, and a, a number of other principles. But these built on what we had been doing for a good you know, five years before that. In Los Angeles, for instance, case study, we have built 35,000 new green jobs since I've been mayor in about seven years. That's about a third to a fourth of all the new jobs period. So my pitch always to mayors is face reality, declare a climate emergency. We are the first city in the world to do so. Set up a climate commission as we're doing, but also integrate the ownership of climate work into everybody. For instance, a chief sustainability officer exists in all of my departments. So the chief of our fire department is as much an environmentalist bragging about how he's reducing emissions as is the person who's in charge of our sanitation department, a more traditional environmental department. When we all co-own this across boundaries and borders, across jurisdictions and bureaucracies, I think we really do have hope that um, economic recovery and climate change can go together. In fact, my last pitch, and I'll close my opening on this, is I always tell mayors, if you're not with this, you're exporting jobs to another city. Do you really want those to land someplace else? Get with it now and you have a shot of building the next generation of careers inside your city and standing up those companies that will be part of the prosperity to come. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just a quick follow up and then, and then I'll move on. The, the, because we're going to talk next about national level multilateral cooperation across the EU. But when you look at the, at the city level, um, where the, the, it's, it's a, how we think about green recovery is different in terms of fiscal policy. You're not going to have the same large uh, in government spending and investment in, in stimulus policy. What do you see as the, the main drivers and tools that a city and a mayor has uh, in opportunities for green recovery when you think about building efficiency or investments in, in infrastructure, electric charging and the rest? And how do, you, how do you do that in a time when the economy is struggling? Well, I think you actually have huge levers. There's going to be an unprecedented amount of money spent. Um, in, in a crisis is usually when things change, right? And policies emerge. When you have the least is when you do the most. And so cities actually do have the bulk of spending in all sorts of environmental categories. Certainly wastewater and stormwater uh, spending is all 
in cities. It's rarely, at least at the, in the United States at the national level. Um, and it's different throughout the world. Some, some mayors are ceremonial and some are very formalized with their power. Some are congruent with the people in power at the national level and some conflict with them and fight with them. So I, I kind of have a game theory box of how close are you to power, how aligned are you to power and how much, how much power do you have? But by and large, mayors are increasingly becoming more and more powerful because national governments are happy to throw these sorts of really taxing things at the local level. So for instance, the city of Los Angeles has the largest municipal utility in the country. We own a part of Hoover Dam. We have a huge infrastructure. We were selling uh, energy to California in the recent brownouts uh, because our capacity has been built and renewable capacity has been built so aggressively. So I would say whether it's a port you control or an airport, we have the largest container uh, port in the Americas that's directly under my jurisdiction, an airport that is the fourth busiest in the world, that utility, or just the infrastructure of what you have, you will be spending a lot. And in the areas I think that are most is usually around transportation and buildings. Most cities don't have their own energy like we do, uh, but those two are two of the big three. So whatever you can do to mandate and to push the electrification of vehicles, mass transit, and whatever you can do to retrofit and electrify buildings, those two things probably will have the biggest impacts of any other initiatives that we can take at any level of government. That's great. Thank you. I want to come back and talk about some of the levers of, uh, that, that, that cities have. Um, but let's, let's move to sort of a much larger geographic region and, and, and cooperation across countries um, in the European Union. Commissioner Simpson, you know, we showed that poll up front. One percent of stimulus toward climate related priorities in the U.S., two percent in China and 20 percent in the EU. So something different is going on in the European Union. Can you tell us what it is uh, and how do you think about the overlap between how did the European Commission think about where to put its spending when it was trying to think about what's needed to get the economy back on its feet, invest in economic recovery, and where there was opportunity to overlap that spending with making progress on the climate challenge. Thank you for a question and good afternoon from sunny Brussels. And um, I'm truly happy to reach out across the Atlantic. And despite the fact that I personally prefer panels where I'm in the same room with other panelists, then uh, at least we are saving a good amount of CO2 by having this chat virtually. So um, I do like panels uh, which start with easy question. And the question uh, uh, why you decided that we need stimulus, but we will still need also uh, a stimulus that helps us to, well, to make our um, future economy more greener and cleaner, uh, then uh, the answer is very, very simple. There was no real alternative. Um, well, when uh, uh, our European Commission started um, um, our mandate in December, we announced that one of our priorities, our major priorities, um, um, climate neutrality by 2050. Europe will be become the first uh, uh, continent um, who has announced that uh, we, we will become climate neutral by 2050. And, and now we know that we also need to stimulate our economies. So both require investments um, and our resources are not infinite. Uh, so it makes sense to prioritize things and to uh, invest into things uh, that uh, check the both boxes. So create jobs and create growth and help uh, with green transformation. So, um, so um, we also know from research like uh, Joseph Stiglitz's and his team's uh, recent work that uh, green recovery measures uh, make better economic uh, sense than traditional less sustainable measures. Um, so um, we know that, um, that we have to invest. We have this agreement here among 27 uh, uh, national governments. And last week, at EU level, European uh, Union's level, we presented our 2030 climate target plan for Europe. And we proposed that we will raise current um, ambition that was to uh, re reduce uh, greenhouse gases by 40% compared to 1990. We will um, raise this ambition and we will reduce uh, greenhouse gases at least 55%. And this plan looks at all sectors. But the um, NIH, of course, has a central role for success. So with the plan, we will speed up the transformation. 
and we will uh, rethink the ways how we produce, consume, and transport energy. But uh, this is clear that the only energy sector can't um, uh, secure us the higher targets. So building sector, transport, um, industry, they have to well follow. And, um, and now we know that um, we have uh, motivation, we have technology, now we have um, additional financing too. So um, Green Deal was always meant to be our growth strategy. Um, but um, in July, uh, we agreed on an unprecedented recovery package for 1.82 trillion euros. Um, and the sustainability is at, at, its, at its core. And uh, it is important to, to, um, to know also that 30% um, that of those funds will be dedicated um, to the green transition. So at least 30% of the money would go to green and sustainable projects and funding will flow in grants and loans to support countries in uh, their investments and reforms. And, um, and of course, we will um, prioritize those projects that, uh, that will create jobs all across Europe. And we know that our member states, they do have different starting points because, well, every national government has the right to decide their unique energy mix. And there are countries who are using um, more renewables, and countries who are still mining uh, coal, and of course, countries who are using nuclear, and the ones who are importing um, natural gas or LNG. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to come back and talk about that in, in a few minutes, including how you decided sort of where to put the investment. Some you talked about creating jobs and, and some really were quite near term, some longer term technology investments like a hydrogen strategy for, for the EU. And I want to come back and talk in a moment about how, how you think about that. But but let me turn, if I could, to Special Representative Ogenby. Um, and, and, and it'd be very helpful to hear your perspective on how you see the pandemic playing out in uh, the developing countries that are part of your mandate to expand access to energy. And, uh, and, and is it possible to do both the green and the recovery elements in, in, in areas that, uh, that are developing countries and that uh, are still, in many cases, uh, working quite hard to develop access to energy in the first place? Okay, thank you everybody and thank you for having me. Um, I think what's really important to note that there is no better time than now to invest in clean. I mean, I'm always of the opinion not to waste a good pandemic. And the truth of the matter is because these countries are broke, they are looking for what will mean economic growth and what will mean jobs. And that's what clean energy brings to the table. You know, um, and that's what COVID response is. There's, there's, there's a trade-off. So instead of the language of just being climate, I think the language should be truly focused on economic growth, like um, the mayor actually said. I mean, my job is to achieve sustainable development goal seven. So it's affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. Now, modern is a part that people like to miss out sometimes. So even before the pandemic, we were not on track to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 7. And it's while we talk about transition and all these great new innovations and technology, we can't leave out the fact that there's still 789 million people that have no access to electricity. But more importantly, there's 2.8 billion people that have no access to clean cooking, right? You cannot achieve climate change without achieving energy access. And I feel sometimes when we, we come up with these stimulus packages and we come up with things like that, we don't really make you know, that connection. Um, so that's why we took it upon ourselves in SE4 to say, how do you recover better with sustainable energy, right? This is a one in a, in a lifetime generation. Um, you know, somewhere like Nigeria, huge oil and gas nation, stop fossil fuel subsidies. It's not something I thought I would ever see in my lifetime, right? It's not because they were really thinking of climate, it's because they were thinking of the economy right now and how it affects them. And we have to take full advantage of what is happening currently in developing countries. There's only 19% of health centers in sub-Saharan Africa that actually has electrification. I mean, while this, 
pandemic has shown how connected we are. That should be an issue for a lot of people, you know? So let's say there's a vaccine tomorrow. There isn't a healthcare system currently in sub-Saharan Africa and parts of South Asia that can actually cope with dispersing the vaccine at whatever temperature is and getting it to the point that is needed. So these are the very practical things I look at and say, while we're doing all of this, how do we increase GDP? How do we increase job creation? We know now, right, for every dollar spent on energy in the developing country, you could have additional GDP of 0.93 cents. That's the fastest way you can have additional GDP. We know that there are three times as much jobs in energy efficiency and in renewables as they are for the fossil equivalent. I think that's what we need to keep on harboring on. But one of the most important and fundamental things and why I think we've, we're, we're basically failing the developing countries is why is it so much easier to get funding for fossil than renewables as in today, even with the pandemic? I was the head of the largest, or what is still the largest energy access program globally, um, and that's only $550 million. And that took 24 months and two years before that to prepare for it. So it took four years to get $550 million for a problem that at least in Africa is $29 billion a year, right? So the truth of it and the elephant in the room is you can't get funding even if you wanted to. Again, I'll go back to Nigeria because that's where I've been working on. You know, we got Nigeria to say 5 million solar connections, that's 30 million people connected by solar. There's not one developing country that stood up and said, we're going to help fund some of this stuff. We're going to move it forward. And, and, and I think that that is, it's really, really critical because this costs money. You're telling people to change the way they do business, to change out of something while still providing power to the people who don't have it, but no one's telling them how to fund it. And then when you, you start looking at it and everyone goes, oh, the country's debt ratio and all these other type of things, it takes seven years to fund any large scale renewable problem. And we want to achieve this by 2030. So for me, what this pandemic has shown is that we have to have, be very ambitious, we should have new goals and we should be less fragmented. And we should really, really think about leaving no one behind. Because if we don't think about that, we, we are all connected and um, it's gonna be worse. And everything we do has to be on the trajectory to Paris, right? The energy access story is a clean energy story. It isn't a fossil story. And people are seeing this, but if they don't actually have the technical assistance and funding to execute, we're just going to keep talking about this. So that's what I'm really hoping that, at least in my new role, I can put a sense of urgency, but also accountability to DFIs, to sovereigns who say they want to fund, no offense, minister, to the EU that has a big EU Africa program. What is exactly going to be done and how quickly is it going to be implemented? Back to you, Jason. That's great. Thank you so much, uh, Damalola. We talked about that <clears throat> a little bit yesterday in our Climate Week event with Andrew Kamau from the Petroleum Ministry in, in Kenya. Our polling question was uh, what percentage, what share of cumulative greenhouse gas emissions by 2040 will come from uh, the continent of Africa? And it's 3%. So it is small, even though one, ad, one of every two people added to the planet moving forward by, um, by 2040. Uh, are going to be African. So you have a, a, a need for dramatic expansion in energy use, and as you said, a challenge in trying to think about how to make sure that is consistent with the Paris goals, which we, we have to. So I want to come back and talk about that, but let me bring Mauricio Cardenas into the conversation, uh, who I think you have a really interesting perspective. You um, were the finance minister of Colombia, with a PhD in economics. You were also the energy minister of Colombia, and, and uh, you serve... Um, now on a panel that the head of the World Health Organization created, the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response. So can you give your, your thoughts and, and what you see broadly in the, in the region of Latin America, how COVID-19 has impacted it, and where do you see the greatest complementarities between the kind of fiscal tools needed for economic recovery and the kind of investments needed to make progress on climate change? Well, thank you, Jason. Let me begin by saying that I'm delighted to be in this panel. Uh, Thanks, uh, John, as well. Um, and delighted to be with uh, Mayor Garcetti and Commissioner Simpson and the Special Representative Ogunbiji. Um, Mayor Garcetti started saying that LA is now the third largest metropolitan area of the world. 
And I am sure that it could also be the largest metropolitan area of Latin Americans on Latin American descendants. So you probably are uh, in a better position than me to talk about Latin America. Um, let me begin by saying that Latin America has 600 million inhabitants. That's about 8% of the world's population. But it has 30% of the world COVID-19 cases and deaths. So this has been devastating for the region. And one of the reasons is that most of Latin Americans live in cities and cities that are very densely populated, um, big agglomerations. And also most Latin Americans, unfortunately, um, work in the informal sector. And the informal sector involves a lot of human contact. So this is one of the reasons why the pandemic um, has, I mean, the epicenter of the pandemic has been Latin America. It is natural that under those circumstances, the initial response of the governments, national and subnational, has been pretty much the preservation of lives and the preservation of livelihoods. It's mostly about the humanitarian assistance. It's, it's like a disaster. It is it's a disaster relief. And this has been pretty much what has happened over the last six months. More public resources for the health sector, um, live lines of support to households that basically do not have an income, um, support to businesses so that they don't, they don't go bankrupt. So I have to be frank and say green recovery has not been mentioned in the context of Latin America in the past six months. But as countries begin to normalize, quote unquote, because lockdowns are now more flexible and our conditions are becoming, um, essentially people are being allowed to leave their houses, um, the recovery issue will become uh, the center of attention. And that's where I think this conversation is so pertinent because we need to make sure that we combine the recovery with the need to adopt a change in the way we normally do um, our business, essentially in terms of growth. One of the reasons is that the initial conditions in Latin America were not very good. The initial conditions in Latin America were five years, the previous five years, of low growth, and in many countries, negative growth. Because since the mid-2010s, there was the end of the commodity super cycle. So these economies were not growing fast enough. And that's one of the reasons that we need a new recovery plan, not just to deal with the pandemic, but to make sure that the engines of growth in Latin America um, are ignited again. So what is, what is Latin America beginning to do right now? Think about public investment. Countries have limitations in terms of what is called the fiscal space. But many countries are thinking about the need to do more public investment. And one of the areas in which public investment can be, have the largest impact in terms of economic recovery is projects in renewable energies, in the electrification of transportation, in building uh, offices and homes that are uh, that save more energy, that are more efficient. So those are the areas in which the region has to concentrate as we go into the future. But this will not be only a public sector issue. The private sector also needs to play a very important role. So one of the areas for public investment is to make sure that it supports the private sector through lending, through guarantees, through even equity in some of these projects uh, to leverage the, uh, the private sector. And this is what countries are beginning to do. So my view is that as we transition from the preservation to the recovery, we have to change some of the tools that have been used during this first initial phase to ensure that when businesses get a loan, subsidized loan by the government, they comply with certain climate standards very much like the European standards that, had, had just, that were just adopted. Or that when households continue to get 
a subsidy, a cash transfer, they do it if at the same time they accept a reduction in some of the fossil fuel energy subsidies that are still so prevalent in, in Latin America. So that we have to transition with the same tools into more climate action. Households that are able to reduce the energy subsidies they've been receiving in the past and firms that continue to get subsidized credit, uh, but only if they comply with what we call now the ESG standards. So I think this is the way to go ahead. Mauricio, thanks so much. A great opening comments. Um, so let's uh, move it, move into the discussion, as I mentioned uh, at, at the beginning. For those of you maybe joining a little bit late, you can submit questions for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And if you're watching the live stream on Twitter at the hashtag CGEP Live and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. As, as I also mentioned at the beginning, unfortunately, Mayor Garcetti has to leave a couple minutes early. So uh, let me start with you and just uh, put a couple of questions toward you. And then I'll ask uh, John Elkind to help me uh, broaden the conversation. But if you could, in the conversation we just had uh, looking at, at Africa, looking at the European Union, uh, at Latin America, I mean, decarbonization you know, requires system-wide changes, how we make cement and steel, fuel airplanes, set national fuel economy standards. Climate is hard because it's the ultimate free rider tragedy of the commons problem. It doesn't matter where a ton of CO2 comes from. So it's not just national solutions. We need multilateral cooperation. So we're all doing this together. So why are cities the right place to focus uh, in the climate crisis? Well, I think cities, um, a couple of reasons. One is cities are nimble. Um, I mean, we, we, what is the old saying that good mayors borrow and great mayors steal? So, you know, whenever we hear something, usually our citizens are the first to say, hey, I heard the mayor of Cincinnati is doing X, Y, and Z, or the mayor of Milan is doing X, Y, and Z. Why can't we do that here too? And that's not just around environment, that's around anything. You know, why can't, think about dining outdoors. We have an alfresco program, like I think you have in New York and other places during the pandemic. Everywhere around the world, suddenly everybody's dining outdoors, at least until in cities where you can, the weather permits you to come to Los Angeles, you can do it year round. Um, but we, you know, see this kind of peer pressure that comes about. And so cities are very nimble, whereas national governments, rightfully so probably, are slower, they take time, they want to negotiate, there's a lot of process. And so, you know, I think the quickest place you can see a laboratory of experimentation and also um, the scale of implementation, I believe, is at the city level. Second, um, there's an integrated way that we do policy. We can't just look at, we don't really chop ourselves up into as many bureaucratic um, areas sometimes as we see at the national level where, okay, you're working on the environment, but I work on transportation. You're working on energy, uh, but over here I'm dealing with water or natural lands. We kind of have to deal with it all simultaneously because the city is, is on top of itself. It's a system of systems. And so when we look at something like water, um, we, we spend a lot of electricity pushing water. You've seen it in movies, the history of Los Angeles, where we stole water from other places. And then we pump it over huge mountains to come to us so that we can use it. Well, when I became mayor, I realized 60% of our daily water use, we were um, purifying almost to a drinkable standard and then washing out to the ocean through our uh, sewage treatment plant, our largest one. And um, so we're going to 100%, we have five zeros in our Green New Deal for Los Angeles. And one of them is zero wasted water. We're gonna recycle 100% of that 60% we were wasting. That's the equivalent of three of those LA aqueducts that you saw in the movie Chinatown that were built through um, a mountain, reducing emissions, providing plenty of water, uh, adapting to the climate change, and we're able to self-finance that. Um, it's hugely expensive. We're testing new technology, see what works best. But I think that's the example. And if you go to C40 cities, you can see this, whether it's African cities, whether it's, uh, um, you know, I was talking to the mayor of Dhaka, um, where 40% of the country is getting flooded regularly. 40% of the country, and soon it'll be 60% in Bangladesh. I mean, climate change, it's too late to reverse. Um, we have a shot at mitigating, and I think cities are always on the front line, and not everybody will be able to afford a $10 billion seawall like in New York. So, you know, when I talk to my West African mayors who are on my steering committee, for instance, they're saying a whole nother level of help that they need and saying making sure we don't at the urban level just replace you know, are polluting cars and sell them to Africa while we're driving around in electric vehicles. We have to make those investments. Uh, to your point, to your point, Dami Lola, um, 
you know, what are those commitments looking like on the ground right now? And how is that being co-written? And I think mayors are very democratic. We don't care if you're the mayor of the fanciest, richest city or the poorest, um, you know, most challenged city. We see each other as peers and we help one another and we have that peer pressure too. So I think it's the most effective place right now to see results. Yeah, and is that you mentioned sort of the, you know, this, these programs we have in place, including here in New York, streets closed, so restaurants can, can have outdoor seating, more walking, cycling, mm -hmm. uh, pedestrians retaking the streets from cars. But as I noted at the outset, you know, we're starting to see things um, go back, go in many ways, go back to normal. So how do you, how, is there a shift? You, you've worked quite hard. I mean, LA is a city long known for cars to expand mass transit, to find alternatives to the automobile. Um, what, do you, what are the steps that cities can or should take now to try to make sure some of these greener, more urban friendly um, uh, things that may have been necessary as a result of the pandemic actually persist, uh, even once we're hopefully past it, which will be soon? We should be realistic that we're not going to go back to the first month of the pandemic when nobody was moving, but we can make progress. Um, we're adding 40 miles of bike lanes. We're I've talked to mayors around the world that are making more uh, walkable, bikeable communities who are closing down city centers in Copenhagen. Uh, they're going to ban cars altogether. Um, it's a tough adjustment at first, and some cities have more of a center than others. It's more complicated in a city like LA. Um, but we're also making huge investments. Los Angeles, the car capital, is building 15 rapid transit lines in the next couple of decades leading up to the Olympics and beyond. Um, that was unthinkable. And voters here, we have to pass any new tax by two thirds, passed it with over 70% vote. So while these things take a little bit of time, I think it's gonna be a combination of building out the infrastructure for this, um, better planning that prohibits uh, moving jobs over here, housing here, shopping there, industry over here, but integrating that more closely together and technology. I think technology will play a huge part. Uh, with autonomous vehicles, with new options like electric scooters and things like that. People are voting with their feet and we have to catch up with them. Um, they do want other options. They want to live closer and walk to a place to go out on a date um, or uh, walk to work. Uh, and we have to build out those sorts of cities. So a lot of this is urban planning, a lot of it's technology, and some of it will be mandates. Um, I, people hate that piece, but it'll drive the markets. I think that, for instance, in the ports, uh, looking at zero emission trucks will help drive that. Um, if we tell every car share company like Uber and Lyft, uh, when you go to autonomous vehicles, they have to be zero emission, they'll do it. You just have to actually put those markers out there and see the world fall. Yeah, it's interesting. Simpson, maybe I could jump in uh, and just go to you with a question that takes, uh, picks up on the uh, one of the themes, certainly, that is utterly important in cities, and that is uh, buildings and the efficiency characteristics of buildings. I know that this has been a, an important part of the focus for the EU and for your uh, DG Energy. Why, are, why is energy efficiency in, of buildings such an important part of your approach to a green recovery? And may, why, just one second, we very much hope that the panelists will uh, jump in and, and respond to each other. And I see Mauricio already wishing to do that after the, uh, the commissioner, please. Commissioner Simpson, the floor is yours. Thank you for the question. And uh, indeed, energy efficiency first is uh, one of the uh, guiding principles of ours, because well, um, we are very worried that we will achieve our um, ambitious targets only if we secure the public acceptance and support. And doing so, we have to show to the uh, wider, um, well, well, the uh, consumers that uh, that um, our green transition doesn't mean necessarily higher costs for them. Right now, we know that 40% of our final consumption goes to the building sector, so uh, either heating or cooling in southern parts, and uh, and. Um, if we are renovating the building sector, then uh, the gains are significant. Well, I'm coming from Estonia, which is a northern part of the European Union. And uh, there is a um, um, renovation is very popular um, uh, because um, after renovation, your heating bills will, will, will be significantly smaller. Uh, but it is not so all around the Europe uh, because especially for apartment buildings, it's difficult to find a cooperation between different donors. If there are 100 or even more apartment donors and they 
have to decide that we are taking loan all together. So, um, so there are some uh, uh, well, well, programs ahead, administrative programs, financing programs, and uh, we will solve financing programs because uh, um, according to the research, 60% of the funds that we are putting into the renovation uh, will find the way um, either in construction uh, sector or in uh, um, materials production sector uh, as salary for people. So um, this is a, um, a good thing that is uh, labor intensive, brings us uh, uh, smaller costs for our consumers and, uh, and uh, we do need uh, less energy to, uh, to secure comfortable indoor uh, temperature both in south or north. So this will be one of our uh, flagship initiatives, Renovation Wave. The exact details will be published next month. Uh, but uh, but uh, we already know that our member states are very eager to invest into renovation, especially because we know that before COVID crisis, there were 11 million uh, workers um, um, employed in construction uh, sector. And well, if demand is down, then um, with a little bit reskilling, they can find new jobs in um, in the renovation sector. Mauricio, do you think that you'll see uh, you'll see renovation waves uh, crossing Latin America? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I think this will go hand in hand with the need to stimulate the construction sector, which is a big source of employment. I wanted to make a comment about cities because I know Mayor Garcet is about to leave or he's going to leave, but I, I am following on the previous question that Jason made. I, why cities? I, I think there is a good reason for putting the focus on the recovery and the green recovery uh, on cities. And I, number one, that's where the main problem today in terms of the need to uh, stimulate the economy is. I mean, if you look at Latin America, the number of cities um, with uh, unemployment figures about 20% is just amazing. We're talking about cities like Bogota, Medellin, Lima, um, more than 20%. And in some cases, um, the, the rate of unemployment for the youth is, uh, is much higher, about 30%. And for women, have been most impacted because of the uh, reduction in, uh, um, in uh, female employment, like in retail. It's, uh, it's even it's much worse than, than for men. So cities is where the problem is. And that's where the solution needs to come from. Um, cities are in a very good position to do infrastructure projects with a great green dividend. Electrification of uh, bus rapid transit systems or the metros or the retrofitting of buildings. So great dividend. Where is the constraint? And I, I hear put my hat as a finance minister. Finance ministers throughout the region are always more willing to accept flexibility when it comes to more borrowing to the national government than it, when it is to the city government. They're more constrained. So this is the time to change that paradigm. It's about, this is when we need cities to be able to borrow more. That's what the good mayors are. Uh, borrow more and engage in this large scale infrastructure projects that generate employment in the short run, but have a dividend in terms of the reduction in emissions in the medium to long term. Thank you very much, Mauricio. Um, if I could come to you, uh, uh, Ms. Agumbi, a, a question that goes back to your remark about the importance of uh, investments in uh, renewable energy infrastructure, and that also links to what Mauricio just said um, we saw the news yesterday that you will be co-chairing uh, an important new commission that has been created by the British government, the Energy Transitions Council, uh, that is meant to focus on helping to deliver around the globe a decarbonized uh, electricity sector, um, and that you will be doing that including together with representatives of the multilateral development banks. Could you talk a little bit about what your expectations are for this new council and your co-chair role? Can it help to address the need that you and Mauricio have both highlighted, the need for capital in order to enable investments in renewable energy going forward? 
Well, I hope so, because that's the only reason why I took the role. Um, it's, it's just, it's really important. It's one of these campaigns where we really want to, you know, stop the use of coal and stop the use of coal financing. So it's actually, you know, focused on, you know, coal, coal to clean and the transition. But again, it, it needs to be done in a, in a practical way. So back, back to what I was saying when, um, you know, international organizations and financial organizations and DFIs and, um, in large institutions say they want to focus on something. It's really important to make sure everybody sees it through. You know, there's some economies who are dependent on coal right now, right? The socioeconomic factors, the jobs, everything is dependent on, on, on what is that fuel source. And um, again, I'm going back to Africa. I'm part of South Asia. No one has actually shown me what is the clean energy transition for any African country or for every South Asian country, like from now to 2050, how are they meant to get there? You know, when are you meant to go from coal to gas, gas to renewables? Or can you, can you, you know, leapfrog, as they like to say, which I find quite hilarious being leapfrogging in the, in the poorest continents. But yeah, apparently we're going to leapfrog to hydrogen or something. And if that's the case, but how is it going to happen? And that's the practicality I want to put on the table. And then the sense of urgency. Like I said, like, again, any typical finance, I'm not trying to call anybody else, has four different missions. Four different missions take a year before they even start looking deeply into the project and, and saying that, you know, this is what we're going to do. And I don't think everybody knows what needs to be done now, right? I don't, I don't think we have to convince anybody what needs to be done. I think what we need to, to focus on is why exactly would any government now decide to go with a fossil fuel equivalent or coal option instead of a renewable option? right? And that's really, really important where it is right now, knowing there could be numerous sanctions. Why do they want to do that? And one is financing and ease, um, unfortunately. So we can, we can even say oh, we're curbing all, all coal financing, but what is the alternative? And, and that's what we're really hoping to bring out from the council. And then actually try to, to make sure funding is done in a, in a cohesive manner instead of fragmented. Because right now, you know, you have like, small pots of money, 5 million for here, 10 million for there, but they don't really do that much. But if they were put all together and you said, I'm going to target this country or that country, and I'm going to actually plan what their clean energy transition is from 2050, it would, it would be really important. Another point, Jason, I know we spoke about it a lot, was just the nature of telling people to stop doing things. I don't think one country should tell any other country to stop doing anything. Um, and especially in an African context, it's almost, it's, it's almost hypocritical. Critical. It's almost colonial looking like I'm using coal in my country, but you stop and we're not financing anything to do with that. It's just a wrong approach. We need to focus on what we know that clean is the best way for economic growth. So I also want to change the language and the approach um, to some of these things. So there's a lot of things I want to do. Obviously, I need support for at least everyone on this call and yourselves, um, but it's, it's, it's important and it's, it's achievable. Um, and we should really, really focus on that and really believe that we shouldn't leave anybody behind while we're, while we're pushing um, climate change and clean energy transition. That's great. Thank you. I want to, um, Eric, turn to you uh, before you depart, just uh, to, to kind of come in on what Mauricio said a moment ago, because it relates mm -hmm. to the question I was trying to get at at the beginning, which is, do cities have the sort of fiscal space to maneuver <clears throat> when one thinks about, you know, economic recovery and where the greatest policy levers are. I'm starting to go through the questions we're getting from the audience. And there's one question along those lines about, you know, whether cities have sufficient resources and legal authority to mm -hmm. enact uh, green energy policies, particularly and to talk about how much of a headwind uh, it is and how much of a challenge it is when the federal government um, is, is in stimulus, not providing aid to cities and, and in general taking the posture this one is toward, toward climate change. Um, and maybe you could say a word before you go to about um, something you've been on the front lines of that's related to this, which is this sort of historic, in my view, shift where the um, environmental activist community and the climate community is coming together with the racial justice community and how, how you see that playing out in a city like Los Angeles and what it means for how we think about the kind of investments that both achieve um, economic recovery and, 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 and with, with equity in mind and also address climate change. 
in two minutes? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so let, let me start with the second first, because I'm going to agree with Mauricio and Danilola about their, their comments uh, in a minute. Um, I do think that integrating an equity lens is absolutely critical, um, whether it's a global equity lens, uh, kind of so-called north-south, or whether it's internal to your country or to your city. There isn't a city that doesn't have equity issues. Uh, those often are on racial lines, often on gender lines. Um, we have networks of, of mayors around the world now that are dealing with this. For instance, C40, an environmental group, it was very important that we write something about this moment, uh, the movement for Black Lives, but it was also a, a richer statement in that it also brought in the voices of African mayors who co-wrote that, um, because I think it's really important to look as, as um, Special Representative just mentioned, you know, um, what does neocolonialism look like? How do we uh, uh, unconsciously um, continue those same patterns even when we're uh, looking to help? Uh, and I think it's really critical to make sure that we're co-authors. Co-authors is kind of the way I look at it now. That's the phrase that I've been using to be co-writers of this moment, both when it comes to racial justice or not. For instance, it's black and brown communities in America that are on the, the that are the so-called frontline communities. Um, the ones closer to an oil well right by their backyard, the ones that are more likely to be near the port with the emissions, uh, higher asthma rates, higher cancer rates. I mean, this literally is, so, so the pandemic, which has gotten us all focused on things like mortality, disproportionate impact on different communities. This is something we've been living with in climate long before the pandemic hit. And I think it's really important um, to feel that. In terms of um, the work of how you integrate that in, I think you, it's, it, it, we don't have enough time today, but you have to consciously look at the organizations that you're a part of. You have to consciously, we have, we have a system that makes, ensures there's gender balance and ensures that there's geographic balance um, and developmental level balance in C40 so that it isn't run by the North for the world or run by the South for the world. It's run by all of us and, and co-owned. Um, lastly, to the first question you asked, I do think that, that um, while some cities and some mayors are more powerful than others, depending on the formal power they're given, they're all immensely powerful. They've got either informal power of their soapboxes and or the formal power of what they actually run. And it's rare the city, a city doesn't have one of the most important levers in the fight against the climate emergency. Uh, it's rare, I've never seen a, a city that really doesn't have its own building codes, right? And buildings are critical. Usually almost all cities are involved either with a strong voice or direct control on their transportation systems, and certainly their roads and what can be on those roads. National governments may trump that sometimes, but it's, it's rare. Again, national governments are happy for us to have to muddle through these things. So to Mauricio's point, I think it is a moment we have to rethink also the structures. We're talking a lot about this. Um, we have, for instance, in C40, to be a member of C40, you have to have a plan that you put forward, 2050 climate, uh, I mean, uh, carbon neutrality, half of that by 2030. And you have to put that plan forward and be held accountable or you get kicked out of the organization. So it works almost like a multinational organization. And we have kicked cities out for not doing the work. Um, but we need to find new institutions that can loan directly to cities. I talked to African mayors and Latin American mayors who are ready to do what they need to do, but they can't get permission from their national government or the, multi, the, the large banks will loan to uh, the national government, pieces are taken away, sometimes there's corruption involved. And, cities are ready to move. And I think we have to think about green banks that do loan directly to cities for projects that can implement the world, the, the work, excuse me, of this climate crisis. And I, I beg your forgiveness as I you. have to go, but thank you all. It's been a real honor to be with you. Thank thanks you. for your time, Mr. Mayor. Uh, great to see you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, Commissioner Simpson, let me, uh, let me turn to you. One of the questions I was interested in, we have a couple of questions in the chat too about about the role of hydrogen. It's an issue that's getting a lot more attention. And so I was curious if you could talk about the European Union strategy toward, toward hydrogen and also how that connects to the way one thinks about stimulus spending. We often think about um, spending, it, spending government, uh, in, government investment in a way that stimulates economic activity quickly, creates jobs quickly. But when you think about investing in the kind of technology we will need to deal with uh, the challenge of climate change, those might take time to play out. They don't happen quickly. So how do you think about balancing uh, investments that can be very, can pay really big dividends, both economically and on the climate challenge, but, but are going to take time uh, to, to, to see those dividends? Well, we launched the first ever EU uh, uh, hydrogen strategy this July. And uh, the um, reason behind it, um, is twofold. Well, at first, well, we know that we achieved our 2020 um, climate targets 
mainly because of the changes in energy sector. And um, several member states have phased out uh, their fossil fuel, coal-based um, power generation faster than we expected. Um, at the same time, we need more electricity um, and we plan to get it mainly from offshore. At the same time, there is a problem that um, when there are good windy um, days, demand might be down. And, and hydrogen is a good solution how we can store renewable electricity. Uh, it is also a very useful tool for sectors that are hard to abate, um, industry, um, heavy duty vehicles. So uh, this helps us to, um, to, uh, to um, uh, change end users that either can't use electricity or this is just too expensive. So uh, there is a great opportunity to replace existing uh, hydrogen production, which is uh, carbon in intensive, with renewable and low carbon hydrogen production, and uh, potential for the production of uh, renewable hydrogen. It differs uh, from member states. But, uh, but our solution is a open and competitive EU market, this uh, smooth uh, cross-border trade, um, and with um, this has important benefits for competition and affordability and security of supply for our member states. And uh, by creating this kind of uh, well-functioning hydrogen market, uh, we, we do predict that green hydrogen will be price-wise competitive with um, grey hydrogen that comes from fossil. And, um, and this uh, recently adopted the strategy on hydrogen. Uh, this acknowledges that uh, a hydrogen ecosystem will develop in Europe over time. Um, and we will uh, concentrate on renewable hydrogen. So electrolyzers at last large scale and um, sufficient renewable electricity uh, are important for us. And by 2050, um, we expect that uh, all our energy mix um, hydrogen will uh, will cover up to 13 or even 14 percent of uh, our energy demand, um, and of course we will we will use it as useful tool for part of the transportation uh, that uh, that hasn't followed the lead so far, because we do see that the demand for fossil fuels in transport sector is still growing, and we have to give an answer: what else can you use? Um, electricity, electricity, of course, but hydrogen um, helps too, and there is. Ex let me let me ask a quick um, follow up question, and and then uh, my colleague John, I think, has a question for Special Representative Ogenby. Um, well, maybe actually two follow up questions. Just a very quick one: Are you um, are you the European Union is thinking about about blue hydrogen and green hydrogen both, and and what's the time frame for those? Indeed. Uh, we are also um, um, ready to use CCS because right now the renewable hydrogen represents only 2% of our hydrogen uh, 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 volume wise. And if we want to replace uh, grey hydrogen with uh, only renewables, then it takes us 10 years. But uh, this doesn't create a, a competitive hydrogen market. So we need uh, a scale up the volumes and uh, in that perspective also uh, CCS uh, technology helps us. And, and the other quick question I had was, um, you know, I spoke with the mayor about the important issues of equity and justice and how we think about uh, addressing climate. And we're talking about areas where we think there's hopefully overlap between making progress on climate and supporting uh, the, the economy. But, but as you know, there is also a, a concern about the costs of making progress on climate change and who bear those costs. And so in the European Union, there's been a very strong uh, focus and a lot of discussion about just transition and how to think about the impact of some of these policies on parts of, 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 of uh, the European Union, like Poland, uh, that have historically relied on carbon emitting fuels. So how does the Green Deal's just transition mechanism help states like that and build the kind of support that we're gonna need for stronger climate action? Indeed, uh, well, Europe and European Union, we are one of the biggest um, uh, importers of uh, fossil fuels, both oil and uh, natural gas. 
but at the same time we have different regions all across Europe who are um, um, mining regions. They are well um, dependent on um, producing and using uh, uh, fossil fuels like coal or lignite or peat or oil shale and we do know that uh, this, this is not only creating jobs in those regions but this is also um, Im important um, um, well, for heating the houses because um, these regions uh, they are using excess heat that comes from uh, power plants and the price is uh, very competitive right now. So our just transition is um, um, meant specifically for those regions um, so that we can uh, retrofit the existing um, uh, district heating uh, um, solutions and we can um, support um, those regions so that they can attract new cleaner industrial jobs because of course we this is not the plan that uh, those people who are who have been working as miners um, for past decades will now uh, go to the other regions and will start building offshore wind farms they need um, new, new jobs in their own um, um, regions Thank you, Commissioner. Um, if I might uh, turn to you, Damalola, uh, a question that picks up on the idea of regions that the Commissioner was just mentioning. Uh, we see that Sustainable Energy for All uh, has just released a series of regional guides on how countries can think about their recovery and also advancing their energy access agendas at the same time. Um, the, the problem of energy access is um, obviously very large, but then uh, the differences from one geographical region, one climate zone to another uh, can make for uh, some specificities. So how much commonality is there among these regional guides? What are some of the key differences that you think are worth um, our audience knowing about and thinking about uh, a bit more uh, as you continue with that work? I mean, firstly, even developing it into region is not breaking it down enough, to be perfectly honest. I think even within the regions, like when we say sub-Saharan Africa, that's a huge mass of people. But we do know that in common, there's an energy access problem, right? We do know then when we move to South a Southeast Asia, it's more about energy efficiency. And then when we move to other regions, it's more about clean cooking. It doesn't mean that they don't touch on some of the other things, but these are kind of the main key, um, key issues. But back to what I was saying before, this is just a guide, right? That what we really need is to have a breakdown, just like how you have in the, um, your L energy policy dog, brilliant site, by the way, really well done, is, is how you, you take that and say, South Africa, 40,000 megawatts of coal, right? How are you going to transition 2 million jobs out of that? Do you know what I mean? To something clean and renewable. And what does just transition really mean, right? And how do you almost have a timeline of policy laid over financing, laid over po political campaign? laid over because the, the the problem with democracy that people don't like to say is that people need to do things every four years right and that totally changed the landscape of if one government decides on this so what what i'm trying to when i talk about urgency is that if the government's right now in power saying this is what we have in two years time or three years time when you finally sign these agreements they might not even be there and then everyone goes, oh, then the country is not committed. No, you, you didn't take up that moment. And again, I'm not trying to say that African governments or Asian governments are perfect by any means, right? But I'm trying to say as someone who worked in there, the frustration where you're having constant meetings with a whole host of different organizations saying they want to help, but from the time they say they want to help and provide this energy transition you need to when they can get on ground and do anything is a long period of time, right? So back to what you were saying in terms of regions, South, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa, you can't go away from it. It's about access, right? But access can also be about clean energy at the same time. 
it doesn't have to be one or the other. And, and, and that's what we try to get from the African guide. And the Caribbean guide, we focus a lot on tourism and energy security, right? In South Asia, we're focusing more on, on clean energy. And we're about to start one on Latin America, and I'm starting to get the results on what we're going to focus on there. Um, but then it's to take that guide and break it down to country-specific action. And just as a quick follow-up, I mean, earlier you uh, drew our attention to the elements of the sustainable development goal number seven on energy, uh, sustainable, reliable, modern energy. Um, has the pandemic with all of the human impact that it creates um, created a, a big new headwind to achieving the SDG seven uh, goal or is it just kind of lost uh, in, 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 the, in the mix? I think it's created a, a headwind, but again, you know, we all have to look at ourselves globally. If you decide that a solution is to bring 5 million solar lanterns into Africa and you, you try and get some praise that you've achieved SDG 7, I have a problem with that because that's not electrification. It might have its place, but it's not electrification. So we also, again, this is back to accountability. We also pat our backs, you know, for, for these little things that little dimensions and, you know, I, I'm also at fault for that. But the issue is that how are you going to kind of provide sustainable modern power for 800 million people, right? Remembering that a lot of these economies still want to industrialize. They're not, they don't just want power for their houses. They want power for where they live. They want power for productive use, right? And how do you make sure that is front and center, economic growth is front and center of your plans to do that? And back to health, one of the things we're doing at SE4 is trying to map out that what does COVID response really look like? Like if a vaccine came out tomorrow, how would the average African country know which parts of its population you know, that's going to take this um, vaccine, where is it going to be? Where is it going to be submitted? And this is, this is data we can get now, right? We can also almost give them the cost on, if this vaccine came out tomorrow, this is how you disperse it. This is your logistics plan. All these things are really, really useful for government. So they put it in their public budget, they go and try and get money for it, but it doesn't always have to be so last minute. So I'm sorry, I know I digress there, but I think these are just really important points. And these are issues that we should be you know, facing head on right now. No, and, and look, I, I think that it's very important that you point out the importance of progress at scale. I, let me just piggyback on that with one question that's come in through the, the Q&A function. Um, is uh, sustainable energy for all being capitalized? At, uh, how is sustainable energy for all being capitalized? Are, are you looking to donor advised funds or public public private partnerships um, SDG bonds and the like? That's the question from Paresh Patel. Um, we uh, typically, most of our funding comes from different sovereigns. Um, and then we have large foundations as well that funds us. But I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's never enough. I didn't say it's not enough. I mean, it, it's never enough. But you know, if all I could do, I guess in my role, is even push large amounts of funding, that's why all our KPIs is now focused on implementation on ground unless we, we failed. We have a big new, very ambitious business plan, but we, we basically exist on how many people we get connected now, right? How many people switch to clean energy. If people had that kind of mentality, you know, the way they take projects on and we could get enough of the donor world and the sovereigns to take that type of approach, I think a lot, a lot will be happening because it's not about SE4 getting funding, it's how do we make sure the right funding is happening on ground and we can count how many people being connected. I'll give you an example. For it, it, it's only about 15% of what is put for off-grid that actually gets done in an off-grid project. That means 85% is spent on admin. That, that's the world we live in right now. That's just not acceptable to me. You know, we need to, we need to figure it out somehow. We need to make sure that the people who need it get get what they need to do and to make sure it's private sector driven as well because we also know it's not about just giving public sector all the money to to have large-scale procurements right some do it very well but some do it very badly um 
Um, and it, again, it depends on the region and the localities you're in. Very good. Mauricio, I wonder if I could turn to you. A um, couple of minutes ago, we were talking about kind of the, the, um, the challenges of reacting to the pandemic. Um, and I know that you've recently been named to the independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response. Could you talk a little bit about what that panel is focusing on and what that lens um, tells you about um, the energy sector uh, as part of solutions, part of the, the challenges uh, going forward. So the intersection between energy on the one hand and your work on this uh, pandemic uh, panel uh, on the other. Well, thanks. Yeah, the primary, primary focus of that panel is the health response. Um, why did this become a global pandemic? Is this because some intrinsic characteristics of the virus or is it because of our response? Things that we didn't do well. We didn't observe the protocols, what had been agreed internationally in terms of how the response has to be coordinated, the transparency, the information, etc. So we are going to look at um, what happened. We're not going to do it with the idea of blaming someone. It's more about understanding so that, first of all, this doesn't happen again because there are many pandemics that can occur in the future. But also, we understand that this is not just the health issue. This is also about the way we responded on a number of other fronts. For example, the safety net protection for uh, people that were not, able, were not able to work, that, you know, not leave their homes, that. Uh, you know, what kind, of, uh, what kind of response is necessary on that social front to make sure that in the future, pandemics are better controlled. But this is a pandemic that still has a present. We're not doing an evaluation of something that occurred in the past. We're looking at the response today. And in the response today, there are still many unknowns. One of them is the vaccine, for example. How is it gonna be widely available? One thing is to have the vaccine. Another different thing is to have the population vaccinated. So these are the type of ideas we will be discussing in that independent panel. We're going to be presenting a first report, preliminary report to the World Health Assembly in November and the final report in May of 2021. But if I could say a word here um, and how this connects with the green recovery, of course, the faster re the recovery of the world economy, the more resources that will be available um, to deal with this and other threats and other pandemics and, and to make sure that um, we have enough resources to go about the vaccination of the population or that we have enough resources to make sure that we improve our, our health facilities. So the recovery is essentially here a, a critical issue for the uh, pandemic itself. In terms of the recovery, I just want to add one aspect which hasn't been mentioned, which I think is very important and I think generates a lot of consensus which is because we have to prioritize. There are many things we would like to do and uh, resources are limited, so we have to prioritize. If I were to choose one area of priority, it would be connectivity, bringing broadband to every single household. This is important, not just for today, because we need to make sure that education is available and that we're not widening the gaps in terms of educational access, but also I think connectivity will play a role in reducing in the future transportation, needs of transportation. And it will make sure that we can live in a world um, with less carbon emissions. So connectivity I will put at the top of the priorities. I think every government should be thinking about that. I'm, I'm speaking from a country where 50% of the students, school age, are not being able to follow their classes online because they just don't have the connection or they don't have the computer or the tablet or th there's some limitation. So this is, this to me, should be priority number one. There are, uh, we're not gonna get to all the questions, but I'm looking for themes that are emerging from several of them. And there are several questions in the chat about nuclear power and why we haven't mentioned nuclear and what role it's going to play or should play in the energy mix, whether there may be an opportunity for thinking about nuclear in terms of electricity for hydrogen. Um, 
Commissioner Simpson, can you talk a little bit about how the European Union is thinking about nuclear power? Well, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, well, uh, the decision what kind of energy mix our member states are using is uh, their own. Um, from EU perspective, we are responsible for their nuclear safety. So we are commissioning some of the old nuclear power plants that were built uh, by Soviets, uh, so-called Chernobyl type reactors. And, uh, and of course, we are monitoring also very carefully what is going on in our close borders. So uh, if our neighbors need technical assistance, we provide them so. Um, we do have member states who have decided that they will phase out nuclear power generation. We do have some who are planning to build their first ever nuclear power plants. And, uh, and uh, uh, we have a very good cooperation with uh, several other um, major uh, um, regions on fusion. This is so-called ITER project, where uh, not only EU, but also United States, China, Japan, uh, Russia, India are uh, um, closely involved. And we truly hope that by 2035, fusion uh, will give us uh, some hope for uh, uh, for um, nuclear power without uh, without a nuclear waste. Um, so basically, nuclear will represent part of our uh, energy mix also after 2050. So we are not planning to have a 100% renewable um, energy system by 2050. Um, and uh, and this is according to the um, thorough uh, impact assessments that we have decided so. Thank you. Do you, um, I don't know if anyone else wanted to come in on that. I, I had a question related. We've been talking about a lot of clean energy technology innovation, whether it's hydrogen or we were just talking about fusion or uh, Damalola, I'm wondering, you know, how, how you hear those uh, conversations. The discussion of clean energy technology innovation it seems to me is often driven by advanced developing economies and many of the needs for innovation uh, the dramatic increase in cooling needs that we're going to see as temperatures rise and um, and more and more people seek air conditioning uh, across uh, parts of Africa and, and other developing countries. Uh, two and three wheel vehicles and, and, and moving away from those uh, to, to four wheel vehicles, uh, low cost renewable microgrid networks, the kind of innovation we need is going to look different in different parts of the world. So how do we ensure a green recovery that allows emerging markets to have a say in the progress of clean energy technology and make sure those innovations have broad benefits? Um, that's a really interesting question. I mean, most of, again, yes, hydrogen, everything is great, but it, it's for countries that have money now and it will be for the next 20 years. And hopefully, you know, developing countries will learn from that. The truth is just having African voices and Asian voices as part of the conversation. Is, is a big start, right? There are many seminars, many webinars that, you know, there's just no representation in, in any kind of way. And we were talking about, you know, equity and then putting people first. The other part that, you know, um, I personally make, made a stance on is to make sure that um, the off-grid is going to be a huge part on electrifying people. And some, sometimes it's shocking how most of the companies, maybe like 90, 2% of companies that get funding are, are not from the continent. You know, it, it's extremely hard to get funding if you're local, you know? Um, and, and I think that that, 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 is, that is a divide that I was, I was quite shocked about, you know, getting on this global platform, but it, it's to have engagements like this and to appreciate that a lot of people from the continent also have really, really cool innovative things, but they need the opportunity. So I don't believe that any funds or any grants are ever kind of stationed to them, right? If they are, it's something like, oh, $5,000 and everyone gets really excited. But we need millions just like in, 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 in developing countries. Um, it's just the same thing as when you saw, you know, some companies being bailed out for COVID. All the companies were, were, were international companies, right? That had raised their series A, B, C, D. These are companies that actually did not stay on the continent when this crisis happened but the people that stayed back got nothing and they still have nothing so I, I i feel that it's just so important at all levels 
to introduce the people from that you're going to help be part of the solution. Um, I think the UK has done this really well. I think the EU has done this incredibly well as well. But it, you know, it, it it needs to it needs to it, need, it needs to continue. Um, and uh, until that happens, and 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 you see, and and it goes both ways. You know, like we were talking, um, Jason, about your African students there, like understanding what's happening there, coming back to continent and then going back. I'm I'm you know I I spent my whole life in the UK, but. I really wanted to work in Nigeria and help out there. There's there's so many students like that, right? There's a whole generation of students in the energy space that want to do something back home, right? Encouraging that, funding that. I mean, the UK government funded me to work with the Nigerian government, funding that and appreciating that and knowing that if they go, they, they're more likely to stay than any expert expats you get for a year or two is really really important to grow this new population and then finally investment in gender and investment in women i think i've trained about 600 young girls now who are doing the most incredible things um it, it shows that if you invest in women on the continent they're actually more effective than the male counterpart by about 23 percent and we just we need to we need to we need to encourage that so that's what i would hope will happen and how we will get real innovation in um, developing countries that's great. Thank you. And we, we spoke about the importance of trying to promote women's leadership in the energy sector and some of what our colleague Julie Marino is doing at Center on Global Energy Policy with our Women in Leadership Program, Women Energy Leadership Program on our podcast uh, with you a few weeks ago. I hope people will listen to that. We're just about out of time, but uh, Mauricio, I wanted to turn to you uh, quickly before we bring it to conclusion. I would just add one thing. I mean, we're being optimistic. I think we we have basically expanded on the points about how to make sure that the recovery is green, that, that we contribute to these two agendas at the same time. But we have to be cautious because uh, there are many bad, bad ideas around. And, um, and uh, one of the key things to keep in mind uh, during this recovery uh, phase and while stimulus packages are being implemented is to do no harm. Because um, some of the policies, some of the projects, some of the initiatives can actually make things worse, can actually not just generate more emissions, but also make them permanent. So if, if, if there are examples of countries, uh, one of them is Mexico, uh, that has put more emphasis on building a new refinery while at the same time stopping an agenda that was basically developing clean energies, like wind, solar. So that's the wrong way to go. Uh, there are ways in which uh, uh, the recovery um, can, uh, can you know, benefit uh, the climate agenda, but there are things that uh, can be done on behalf of the recovery that will be uh, damaging for climate. Great. Commissioner Simpson, if I could maybe just ask you for a closing word to uh, give us a sense of how you're thinking about where we should move going forward to try to both deal with the climate challenge and also economic recovery from the standpoint of the European Commission. Well, for us, our Green Deal agenda is not just about uh, climate and uh, global challenges. It's also a growth strategy. And we truly believe that if we can lead by example, then we will find partners and followers. That's why I, I truly uh, feel that this is amazing that today the Chinese president announced in front of UN General Assembly that China will achieve climate neutrality before 2060. So uh, these kind of uh, uh, well announcements all across the world, they do mean a lot uh, because, well, Europe emits only 9% of the uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we can provide our uh, expertise. We do have technological leadership in many techn technologies, for example, on offshore wind. Uh, but, uh, but if we uh, show that this is... Um, also beneficial for our economy. This is part of our growth uh, strategy. Then uh, I, I hope that we will find um, other governments who will announce similar uh, similar ambitious plans. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, discussion. I hope to see you soon. Well, thanks to, to all of you. I wish we had much more time. Such a rich discussion with our distinguished speakers. Commissioner Kadri Simpson, Mauricio Cardenas, Special Representative Damalola Ogenby, and Mayor Eric Garcetti. Thanks uh, for joining us. Thanks uh, to all of you watching today for tuning in. 
As I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available soon on our website. Today's webinar, again, is one of a series of virtual events that the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as part of Climate Week NYC. The series will continue tomorrow with a discussion on ensuring an equitable and just global energy transition at 10 a.m. Eastern. And that discussion will be followed by the global launch event for a new publication, Energizing America, which charts a roadmap for how to increase investment in energy innovation. That will be at noon Eastern. The full schedule of our Climate Week events is on our website, energypolicy.columbia.edu. Thank you again uh, for being with us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.